started to work on the foundation series, the next uh, piece in this is actually would have been craving. And then I thought, what would happen if I if I taught you this from the from the way the, in the direction that the that the Siddhartha, the Bodhisattva, actually figured this out, uh, because so many there's a lot of confusion about about the what's called the Analoma and the Panaloma, the forward and the reverse order of the Paticca Samapada. And the confusion, it's, it, it, it's, it's accurate the way you say it, but what always, um, you know, after I had a few experiences, I really had a lot of questions about why are we uh, emphasizing that that way when he discovered it starting with death. He didn't start by discovering the Paticca Samapada by looking at ignorance. In fact, he never would have discovered if it had started with ignorance, ignorance to search for it. He wouldn't have, uh, maybe he would have been able to figure it out, but nobody else would be able to stumble on how this works um, unless they had enough knowledge about how, what it's for. And you have to hear a few, you have to hear a great deal of the suttas in order to understand and, and you have been exposed to a lot. If you've been involved with Bhante Vimala Ramsey or myself, you've heard a lot of the suttas uh, to understand that this is actually a functional tool. And when we give you the working, the working, um, the seven link working chart, that is the chart that is what happens in this life to deal with your problems, with your um any kinds of depression you're having, anxiety, panic attacks, anything like that, everything can be figured out pretty easily by understanding that seven link chart. This is one that we made of the seven link chart. And what I did with it was I set it up so that over here you had a problem and you chose the problem. And then here you chose which sense store was going to process it through. And then you went from when the contact happened with the sense door to feeling, to craving, to clinging, to habitual tendency, to the birth of your reaction or to the, what, if in the case of depression, for instance, you're sitting there, it just tumbles down on top of you. But before it tumbled down on top of you, it had to start over here with like mind and then from mind a thought and then a painful feeling and I don't like it and then start stressing you out because you've had it happen before and so you pick out a card um, you're, you're talking about the clinging that's involved with it and you pick out a card and give birth to the depression happening again hitting you again so that would be depression anxiety is the same way um, you know stress is the same way all these things seem to happen to us uh, it, with a blink of the eye, but inside our brain, actually, it's happening differently like a movie. And so the value of this for today's world is quite extraordinary because when I take people and show them how this works, they go, you mean it's not my fault? It's not me? And you mean I could do something about this? And doing something is interesting doing something about this by breaking the chain can happen at any point inside it you don't have to be a buddha and have all ignorance completely gone so that you're not stupid anymore and you don't park in the wrong place <laughs> you know <laughs> you get a ticket i mean you know you don't have to have everything gone you know? but you can be at any level in development okay and this can this can happen to you that you really begin to understand this chart and use it another thing is people get sort of hung up you know because they think well in order for me to really do what she's talking about i have to be a soda pond or something like that that's not true that's not true you can be starting to work with dependent origination at any time in your development you choose and you're retraining your brain and it's teaching you how to let go of things. I mean, this is absolutely 
a neat thing, a really neat thing. And you can teach it to kids. This is another thing. You can teach this to 10 year olds, nine, 10, 11 years old. And you can certainly teach it to teenagers who are going into high school or, or high school kids that are going into college before they go to college and see all these people going through stuff and have no idea what's happening to them or to the people around them. So this is like pulling up the curtain and, and showing us how the world is really working. But the question is, what does that word volition mean? You know, that's one word that used to really get me. And so I played again, I've done this several times. It always frustrates me, but volitional formations that used to really stagger me. So, so volitional formations are still a problem for me. I actually wrote Big Kabodi a letter and he was really, really busy and I didn't get anything back, but I need to write again and try to pin him down on this because I really want to understand when ig with ignorance as condition, volitional formations arise. Well, volitional mean, means the power of choosing, determining, will, a choice or decision that's made. So you're making a choice or decision. So that that backs up the fact that you are uh, determining what to do with something, okay? And then in Merriam-Webster's dictionary, the power of choosing slash determining colon will. Again, we see will all the time. So it's free will. It's the ability to choose. But my biggest question has always been with ignorance as condition, formations arise. Bonte and I always say formations arise because I, we all sat there and we said, well, who chooses? Who is choosing or whose will is there when you look at that link and you see volitional formations? Okay. Now, one thing that happened is one person, one monk decided to say, Volitional fabrications. Now that one really blew my mind because fabrications comes from the word fabricate. And my big question, once again, I always go back to, well, who's there making this fabrication of something happening? Actually, it's just flowing uh, karmic energy coming in and forming this human being, coming into the pregnancy and coming out. Now, you know, I've seen a lot of babies born. Some of them come out you know, like that. Some of them come out like my grandchild came out and not and saying, ah, ah, and then looking around in total amazement that they're not in the womb anymore. And then she got this big smile on her face of, wow, I'm out of that cramped space. What's this? What's this? And the eyes got real big and you could see in the pictures, I'll show them to you next week, I'll show them. You need to remind me, May, send me a note to show the baby pictures because there's some little baby pictures that are just, you're wondering what's going through this kid's mind. She's supposed to have a newborn brain, right? And she's not supposed to know anything. And here she is with this look of total amazement at where she is. It's really priceless. So wondering what you're actually choosing and then with, you know, formations as condition, mentality, materiality, then we get into the relationship of the anatomy of the physical body with the, um, the relationship between mind and body connection. We're talking about that. And then the six sense doors we can all understand are operating in the body. Okay, and then the next one, is contact and contact we know how it happens with the eye that forms the you know consciousness and contact happens and then the next one is feeling comes up by then you can see there's something there is something going on where you can make your brain goes pleasant painful neutral like that very quickly but there's no real 
just no person is really there with volition is not you don't hear volitional feeling or anything you feeling and they also proved it's interesting because in research they can wire up the body and even if the person is unconscious they can tell if there's a feeling that's pleasant painful or neutral that's really something you know they can do this with wiring and attaching to the skin and everything like that and the brain and they know something's going on Okay, after feeling, you have craving. Now, this is where we were going to go into craving, clinging, habitual tendency, birth of reaction, the way we explain it, or birth of action. If you are totally trained, you have more of a birth of action. And the uh, person who is um, reached attainments as more of working with actions than reactions, because the reactions are reducing. But when on you build the build the chart, you want to say both are possible there. It's up to the situation, okay? And then those birth of the reaction, the habitual tendency is pulling out the card to see what that's going to be. And then there's a reaction or an action. Or you don't bother with the card. It just flows through. You've closed your library. And there's no reason to go and pull a card for habitual reactions. And you just move forward and that's an action from a trained mind so are you with me you're pretty much with me okay everybody yeah okay so but you know what that's not how um that's not how he discovered this and this discussion i had this afternoon with newton was interesting because we were looking at what's called the analoma and the panaloma and the analoma, uh, it's A-N-U-L-O-M-A, -A, the anuloma and the panuloma. And that's just the forward and reverse order of the dependent origination. But there's a, there's a problem here. <laughs> I keep asking questions. There's a problem, see? The question is, how do people heal themselves by gaining knowledge and their reactions stop and actions start to take place so there's less and less reaction how does that happen so i started asking that question and i must be clued into someone something because i remember i first started asking that reaction and then within a few days about a few days maybe a week and somebody called on the phone and described how they were healing themselves from what they had learned in a retreat so how were they healing, meaning stopping their bad habitual actions, their, their habit of uh, getting really, really upset at something that was going on and changing that to forgiving and compassion and loving kindness towards the people who were doing this towards him and his Because what he did was he first decided no matter what happens, when we take a walk tonight and the van comes by to harass us from these guys in the neighborhood, it's up in New York City somewhere, okay? And they start harassing us as we're walking along. I'm not going to yell back. Of course, his wife probably smiled at him, <laughs> I bet, <laughs> you know, because they always got him so upset. But he didn't. And he said he didn't. He was calling me. He said, I don't understand why I didn't. Can you tell me? I said, well, tell me exactly what happened. So what he happened was the, the action took place where they were harassing them with vulgarities and everything while they're trying to just walk in the evening on the sidewalk. And he just can't explain it. He said, so this is equanimity, right? his equanimity and he's never experienced it where it just never grabbed him before and he simply turned and looked at them right in the eyes and he started smiling and just sending forgiveness to them basically for their ignorance and lack of knowledge and you know not understanding anything and then he sent them uh compassion he used compassion let's make sure we understand what he did he and i explained it to him. you used a pause that was active compassion 
and let them do whatever they want. You see? Um, there's an old thing we heard when I was growing up, you know, sticks and stones will break my bones, but names will never hurt me. And that's the game he was playing. I said that to him and he grew up to, oh, he said, that's what's happening. Yeah. There's the throwing sticks and stones, vulgarities and really profanities and really filthy stuff at them. And he's just letting this just come over him. How? Remember Majima Nikai number 62? Do you remember Rahula was taught about the elements. Do you remember why he was taught about the elements? He was taught about the elements because when the water's coming down the stream, you see it gets to a rock. Instead of getting all upset, it just goes like this and goes around the rock and keeps going down the mountain. That's what happened. So they came and that was his, his rock. And he just, that action they threw at him was the stone in the stream. And he just smiled at them and he let go. <laughs> he just let it go and with compassion allowed them to vent while they were at the light, which is where they always stop, but they just sit there and wait, you know, and you're afraid to cross the street because they won't go so you can cross the street. He said, we just stood there. He said, I just sent them the loving kindness. And then they just got quiet. They couldn't handle that. And they got back in the ground, away from the window. And then they just drove away and harassed somebody else probably. Somebody, it's almost like the picture of the little boy in third grade who pulled the girls, she did the, he pulled the girls' pigtails when, in third grade. And then this grown man at 56 years old has met this woman again in Canberra, Australia, in the, in the store. And um, he says hello. She says hello. He goes home and feels terribly guilty. Now I remember who that was. I sat through third grade pulling her pigtails and then saying, oh, she did it. She's the one that made the noise. I have no idea what she's doing. And the teacher bought it and persecuted this little girl through third grade. And he was delighted. <laughs> and he never said he was sorry. And here she was with a beautiful short haircut. <laughs> That was what was funny. And he figured out who she was. And he said, I felt so bad. I said, what'd you do? I got my forgiveness out. He used his forgiveness, practiced his forgiveness, then started sending compassion and loving kindness to her and joy. You see, she married. She's on the other side of the city. This is really so funny that he called about that. But he said, it really hit me because I had worked on forgiveness. And then when I was confronted with this old action, here it was. And so what I was gonna do with you is, I probably have talked about this in some ways, but I want you to think a minute. Like I said, you always hear this in the analoma going up into the suffering. And then you hear about it from the bottom again. Now, the Buddha did point something out about that part because he said there in the in the Samyutta Nikaya, it's in, it's on page 536. If you've got the Bhikkhubodhi Samyutta Nikaya, it's on page 30, 536. Number three, and it's called the two ways. There's a tiny little sutta here. And he says that Sawati, and this is after he's enlightened, he says that this he's teaching this to the monks. When you do teach this, he's saying, this is what you do. Bhikkhus, I will teach you the wrong way and the right way. Listen to that and attend closely. I will speak. Yes, venerable sir, the bhikkhus replied and the blessed one said this. And what bhikkhus is the wrong way to teach dependent origination with ignorance as condition, volitional formations come to be. With volitional formations as condition, consciousness comes to be, and so forth. That way, on up from the bottom all the way to aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. 
this is called the wrong way. So he doesn't want them, he's trying to make a point, he doesn't want them to go out and teach how suffering works and nothing else. But then he says, and what bhikkhus is the right way to teach? Now listen to the phrase, with the remainderless fading away and cessation of ignorance comes the cessation of volitional formations. Now with the guy in New York where they were harassing him, with the cessation of his ignorance was the cessation of producing any more volitional karma, which is a form of formations. What, what, is, what is karma? Action. What is action? It is mental, verbal, physical action, right? So he was no longer producing any other. He was using volition and he decided not to act with unwholesome formations. Then with the cessation of the volitional formation, cessation of consciousness, with the system, now that is a reverse order. It's true, but he's trying to get across the point. If you're going to teach how suffering works, be sure your class is long enough for people are you know, stay awake or, you know, that you've got, you're teaching them both halves of this, not just how it happens, but how it no longer happens. And this is what we're missing a lot in Buddhism right now, just general Buddhism with people going to temples and stuff. They don't get to hear this kind of thing, you know, when they're just going and the Analoma Panaloma, when I sort of tried to research it, I think Bhante can agree with me on this. The Thais used to do this systematically in the Thai temples in the mornings. I used to sit with them in Detroit and New York and um, in um, Baltimore and a couple other cities. At Thai temples, they always do the Analoma, the suffering, and then the Panaloma in this way. So you get both sides of it, okay? And what happened is the bodhisattva, I mentioned at the very beginning of this discussion, how did this Paticca Samapada come about in this story? And we found this section in 537, origination, it's called. And you see, he's speaking to you about how it was before he was enlightened, you see. And many Buddhist traditions are basically saying he didn't know anything about this process until after he was enlightened, like he, he saw it himself as he was enlightened. And that did he, some of them will say he spent seven days walking around where he was by the Bodhi tree and he was actually trying to figure out this whole thing. But the thing is, he already knew it. Why? Because of the sutta. So listen to this. Bhikkhus, before my enlightenment, while I was still a bodhisattva, yet fully, un, fully enlightened, not yet fully enlightened, sorry. It occurred to me, alas, this world has fallen into trouble in that it is born ages and dies it passes away and is reborn yet it does not understand the escape from this suffering that is headed by aging and death when now will an escape be discerned from this suffering that is headed by aging and death and then because it occurred to me when what exists these questions came up when what exists does aging and death come to be? By what is aging and death conditioned? Then bhikkhus, through careful attention, there took place in me a break by wisdom. When there is birth, aging and death comes to be. Aging and death has birth as its condition. So now if you go through this carefully here, you begin to understand how each one of these is working, okay? And then the next, and let's do this one. Bhikkhus, it occurred to me when what exists does birth come to be? 
How did birth come to me? So what is he doing? Number one, he's not meditating. Number two, he's pondering and reflecting on the pondering that he's doing. Maybe he was doing it while he was walking. I like, I, you know, I'm crazy. Maybe he went to the library and sat by a big table and <laughs> he was working it out there, but they didn't have a library, my understanding, and they didn't have a big table and they didn't have chairs, you know, but they were pondering things. Now, in all of this, you know, um, one of the things I turned up in one of my research books was um, how much was in Buddhism, the credit goes to the Buddha because he's encouraging questions. He's encouraging discussions, sorting out the kind of stuff we all did when we were 15 years old, <laughs> trying to figure out how did all this happen? How did I get here? You know, and the roundness of things where you sit up all night and say, well, most everything is round like my finger, you know, like the trees and the world and all this stuff. And then we finally, after four or five, six hours, I don't know if you did this, but this is what happened to me. Four or five, six hours into that, somebody said, well, the thing is something came from nothing. <laughs> <laughs> At which point, everybody's so tired, we, we can't contemplate this any further. Remember, we didn't have quantum physics back then. There was no hologram theory that you are all living in a holographic universe that wasn't there. That was not even thought of yet. I'm talking the early 1960s, you know, and everybody's trying to figure things out. See, this is where he is. You know, he's trying to figure out how this is working. So by what is birth conditioned? Careful attention. There took place in me a breakthrough by wisdom. When there is habitual tendencies, we say. Habitual tendencies happening in your life. This is how we do the phenomenological angle of this. Habitual tendencies or reactions birth comes to be birth has existence as its condition that's the other word for habitual tendencies existence right existence is full of reactions and you're suffering and then you find buddhism and it says calm down come in the temple <laughs> sit down be still don't move <laughs> Close your eyes. Just breathe. See? This is the beginning of everything. Calm down, right? Then maybe you'll begin to see a little more of what's happening. See? Then he does another one. When what exists does this habitual tendencies or reactions come to be? By what are these reactions conditioned? And the through careful attention, took place in me a breakthrough by wisdom again. When there is clinging, these habitual tendencies, they come to be, these habitual reactions have clinging as their condition. Remember now, feeling painful, craving, I don't like this building up of tension, right? building up tension and then it grabs your head and clinging is in there this is just like what aunt sue did just like what happened last year just like just like just like just like ah, i'm gonna pull out because it's just like this and i'm just gonna react there's your reaction and you don't even know what's happening you don't even realize it's happening. When he was walking on the street and everything, he didn't realize how much this stuff had gotten into him, into his mind. And it happened that it was automatic when he was standing there smiling at them. He was just smiling at them. But his brain took over and immediately he was forgiving them and smiling, using compassion, 
and the loving kindness was flowing. He was practicing. He was practicing because he had cancer. He was terminal. He was staying in New York City there because he was closer for treatments. He's gone now. But the thing is, he got enough of this to really understand that he didn't have to let anybody disturb him. Nothing should disturb you. This whole adventure is letting go. Somebody said, what does that mean? You have to watch out now because you know I studied opera, right? <laughs> Musically, it means you see it's like a scale she can do it on the piano somebody here play a horn you can put it in there that's what it is and it's like check this out when you do go through and you come out the other side it's like the discovery of a newborn brain. Because of the lesson I have always taught you about the past and the future, and you're right here in the middle. Remember that? You are the ones who are like right here. Here I am. <laughs> I knew I had something up there. Okay. So this is the past over here. This is the future. And you're just going along here to the future, everything back here, everything back of you, it's gone, used up, energy gone, can't change the shape of it, can't repaint it, can't even sculpt it in another shape, it's already solid, can't do it, can't change anything in the future, no point in putting anything in that direction, no good, uh-uh, okay, no good over here, uh-uh. Uh-uh. <laughs> okay. Only thing you can do is where you are. I came and had a great saying. Wherever you go, there you are. <laughs> Wherever you go, there you are. Now think about this a minute, will you? Because this is a big deal. You don't think it's a big deal. But if you were carrying all of this stuff from here back to the time you were born, on your back in a backpack, this can be a very heavy thing. I mean, this guy could hardly stand up. He was just wobbling all around until he just fell down. I told him, get back up. He tried again, but the problem was, as he was going along, he started leaning in this direction. I said, what's wrong? I have a day pack on too. A day pack? Yeah, on the front of me. We'll take it off. Okay. He took it off. Then all of a sudden he realized, oh my gosh, this is a great place. It's like a little crystal car. It's made just for me. Yeah, it is. And it's perfect if you would only choose to live in the present time. Nothing can hurt you. It's like you're in a little glow because the moment something happens, then it's in the past. So you're in the car. You see, think about it this way. Unless Unless you open the trunk like that and go to put something in the trunk. If you put something in the trunk, it starts to get heavy again. That's right. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, bye. Yeah, but the whole point is, I'm getting ready to teach this to children. I just thought I'd check it out, okay? So the thing is, this stuff is not complicated. Okay, so you have the origination. He was figuring it out, but you see what he was doing. This is called deductive reasoning. This is called neti neti. I'm wondering, do you want to go forward to examine it from craving, clinging, habitual tendencies, and birth of action and aging and death? Or do you want to go the way the Buddha figured it out and look at it for a period of time and start testing it between each talk and start testing what is aging and death? How many different ways can we apply this aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair? 
remember the way that we're looking at this is a working chart. I like Steve Linden. He's a really good guy. Linder is his name. Steve Linder, designer, Chicago. He made a chart for us that looks like this. See? And this chart has the potentials. Okay. Or, or I'm sorry. It starts over here with ignorance. And then you fold that one away. And then you have two potentials, right? And then you have the four links that have to do with the anatomy only. Can you see? Kind of. See? Yeah. And then what happens is you have the five last links. So you take, you take one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And those are the ones that are the take you into the red, the red zone. The red zone is from here. Craving, clinging, habitual tendency, birth of reactions, and sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. During the aging of the event happening and the death of the event. So what we've done is we take it and break it down to understand why are we teaching it this way? Well, because that was how he taught it in relationship to the stories and persuading people and all that stuff you can go and see and you can apply what's happening in the story and see the dependent origination happening. It's right there. And the Four Noble Truths are in the text too, that way you can see them. So this is nice because at the bottom of his chart, he put the Noble Truths here and then he put the um, Eightfold Path, the Eightfold Path here. So those are your two support systems, but he also put, um, let's see, mm -mm -mm. the Four Noble Truth application on this column. The Four Noble Truth application is shown here, how the different ways you can use the Four Noble Truths in life. And then to outline the Dhamma, to plan and investigate your investigation, a teaching method for Dhamma talk style and the four step problem solutions, which is arbitration in, in conflict, arbitration. And then he's pointing out at the bottom, this is a mind yoga. It is watching the impersonal nature of how everything operates. And then over here, he put right effort because that's the thing that carries you through the steps of your practice. And then at the bottom, he's pointing out, remember that the wholesome is no tension and tightness and the unwholesome is tightness and tension. Then bhikkhus through careful attention, there took place in me a breakthrough by wisdom. When there is no birth, aging and death does not come to be and the cessation of birth comes the cessation of aging and death. So he's going backwards now, see, like that. 